So after scrolling through all of the comments in part one, I realized that quite a number of you wanted a single core hyper-threaded simulation, and that is exactly what I've done here. This is part two of four where we simulate a single core hyper-threaded gaming experience. You'll be surprised by a thing or two in this one. Okay, so this time around, we're going to enable hyper-threading and reduce our active processor cores down to one, which will essentially give us a single core hyper-threaded CPU, which is what a lot of you were asking for uh, in the comments after part one. So here you go, folks. Let's see if hyper-threading really makes much of a difference here. Okay, folks, so there you go. So core zero and core one. So this is effectively a single core processor with hyper-threading enabled for a grand total of two threads. Now I am gonna open up Battlefield 1 and attempt to benchmark that game. It would not open with one core activated, but maybe with hyper-threading we can change things up. Okay, you can see same exact settings as last time. Pretty much everything on except for MSAA and no advanced graphics. Here we go, folks. Uh, let's, let's see if this is any better than last time. Okay, been waiting for, I think, nine minutes now. Yep, almost 10 minutes and the benchmark is still loading. I mean, like, the first part of the benchmark. I haven't seen anything but the loading screen for the past nine to 10 minutes. Hey, we're actually, we're not flying through the ground like we were last time. Quite a bit of frame stuttering, I noticed up front, uh, but at least we're following the jet through the air and not on the street. Well, I am very impressed by how much of a difference hyper-threading has made here. Keep in mind, folks, this is with max settings minus MSAA. You could actually play this game. I mean, it's playable right now. Yeah, you'll have frame skipping every now and then, but you could play this. Okay, maybe you could play the game from in the air, but uh, when it comes to playing on the street, uh, it's probably not gonna be, yeah, this is, this is pretty bad. Hey, Explosion actually looked pretty good as well. Okay, and it looks like a noticeable improvement in City Skylines as well. So, uh, yeah, zooming in still absolutely destroys frame rates. But, at least we're not dipping down into single digits here. So you can see we're hovering around, well, the mid-teens. So 15 to 20 FPS when zoomed all the way in. And then, zoomed out, we're looking at around 30 to 40, especially when you're not staring directly into the face of some dense cities. So another way you can tell that we are definitely CPU bound is by analyzing the water transitions here. So this is very uh, heavily physics based and typically this is a smooth experience when all four cores and hyper threading are all activated. Uh, but because we only have one core, we're seeing a lot of micro stuttering going on. It's not a very fluid transition, not like it typically is. And the fact that it's raining in the game is making things much worse. So while this experience still might be choppy and unenjoyable, especially when zoomed in, we do have to note a very substantial and noteworthy improvement with the addition of hyper-threading. So hyper-threading in this case makes a huge difference. Uh, so I imagine that the effects of hyper-threading might be scaled down as we increase core count. Pleasantly surprised by how quickly the game loaded. It took about 12 minutes the first time, but with hyper-threading enabled, only about a minute and a half. So the game is no longer skipping frame to frame like it was with only one core. No hyper-threading. You can see here, we're actually getting respectable frame rates too, uh, staying around 30 for the most part. I'm just glad we no longer have to record this game in seconds per frame. We can actually do this in frames per second now. I am shocked by how big of a difference hyper-threading is making in all of these titles. So remember, we were at 0.1 FPS over here. I mean, 0.1 across the board. It was virtually zero frames per second. Now we're getting 21.1 on the average and as high as on the normal batches, 30 FPS. So that's, that's awesome. So let's go ahead and test out Warhammer next. And then I guess we'll throw the rig at Battlefield 1. The CPU is just struggling to get this thing started. And there we go. 
You know what, it seems like hyperthreading has corrected the frame stuttering issue we had in part one. So we had at least a 10 FPS boost overall, and you can tell just by looking at this chart here, our frame rates have, are just more consistent across the board. We did have the same frame drop here that we had in part one. I wonder what goes on at that point. But for everything else, just much more consistent, much more fluid, and a very minimal frame stuttering this time. So a few of you in the comments asked for a game like CSGO to be tested, and that's exactly what's about to happen here. And then I'm also going to restart the computer, turn off hyperthreading, and rerun the test to see if hyperthreading makes that much of a difference in a game like this. Okay, so I do notice here gameplay isn't as smooth as it was with four cores and eight threads. Um, we're probably not even maxing out the uh, refresh rate of our monitor, but we are still getting, I assume, well over 100 FPS here. I'm benchmarking right now with Fraps, so I can't actually see the frame counter. Okay, so there's the frame counter up top. You can see we're getting around 100 FPS here in CSGO with a single core and hyperthreading enabled. So now let's see if turning off hyperthreading drops those frames by any significant amount. Okay, and right off the bat, I can see that really not much change. We're still hovering around 100 FPS, and this is with hyperthreading disabled. So we're running on just one core and one thread. Look at that, still getting, well, okay, some frame stutters here and there. Still getting roughly 100 FPS on average, and this is with everything maxed out in-game. Okay, so we look to be doing okay here in Battlefield 1. Uh, every now and then we get some weird artifacting, you saw that right there. All in all, right now, I would say, yeah, you can play Battlefield 1 on a single core CPU with hyper-threading enabled. As long as you get a solid frequency to back it up and a good amount of L3 cache. Right now, fairly smooth. I would be okay playing this on a computer with a single core. And there it goes. But, as you can see, See, 30 frames per second, that is not bad. If you'd have told me 30 minutes ago that Battlefield 1 would have reacted in this manner to a single core hyperthreaded processor, I would have laughed at you. But I will say this, even though these frame rates do deem a game like this, especially a new game like Battlefield 1, uh, playable, it, it still goes to show you why we don't manufacture single core chips for desktop uh, PCs anymore. Uh, and while a lot of the rendering and processing will be done by the GPU in a game like this, the CPU still has to take care of a lot of the physics calculations, a lot of the things rendered in the background, uh, it handles things like viewing distance changes. So a lot of that is the responsibility of the CPU, and without a CPU with multiple threads, you will run into some severe bottlenecks and stuttering. Thanks to hyper-threading in this case, we didn't see much of that even in Battlefield Beta. So with that folks, I want to hear if you were as surprised as I was the differences hyper-threading makes in games like these. These are relatively CPU intensive, save like CSGO, but I mean, for the most part, these are taxing on CPUs, even 6600Ks and 6700Ks, quite high CPU usages at 1440p. So I want to hear from you what you want to see next in part three, what kind of core simulations you would like, dual core, dual core hyper-threaded, three core, I don't, I don't know, something weird. We can do any of that in part three. It's up to you guys. Let me know in the comments what you want. Be sure to give this one a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Give it a thumbs down if you feel complete opposite or if you hate everything with life. Be sure to click the subscribe button if you haven't already. Stay tuned for more Science Studio stuff here in Science Studio. This is Science Studio. Thanks for learning with us.